fork by four o'clock. Good morning and welcome to the second I'm day of the uh, Texas Neurologic Society Summer Conference. Yesterday was uh, uh, riveting. The talks were excellent and we have some wonderful talks today. So I want to remind everyone to complete their CME reporting forms and speaker evaluation forms. When you're done, turn them in at the end at the desk on your way out. <clears throat> we will have a refreshment break from 10 to 10.30. And this afternoon, there is the Practice Management Symposium. It starts at 12.45 and will be for two hours. We have a representative from the American Academy of Neurology with Dr. Stuart Black discussing MACRA, as well as the um, X Axon Registry that's uh, available through the American Academy of Neurology to help us with all of this. Um, our first speaker today is Dr. Suarez. He will be speaking on neuromuscular emergencies. He is the head of the Vascular Neurology and Neuro Neurocritical Care at Baylor College of Medicine and St. Luke's Hospital. He has trained at multiple places, including Bogota, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, Case Western Reserve, Beth Israel, and is now at Baylor. He sits on numerous chairs, numerous committees, and is published extensively. Dr. Suarez. Okay, good morning. Um, I guess I'll be the first speaker of the day, so my job is to make sure that you're way awake by the time we're done here. Hopefully you won't fall asleep. Um, so what I wanted to, uh, to share with you this morning, and I hope everybody can hear me there in the back, um, is uh, to go over the evaluation of the patient with neuromuscular emergency the way we do it in the neuro ICU. Okay, so this is, um, let's see if I can get it, yeah. So I don't have anything to disclose, you know, I'm just a neurointensivist, you know, so obviously all my research comes from uh, NIH uh, from the government. So we'll go over the, uh, the spectrum of neuromuscular disorders in the ICU, then we'll talk about how to approach those patients and then go over some of the most common conditions uh, recurring ICU care. So let's, let's start with a little bit of the, of the history of, of neuromuscular disorders. Um, uh, you know, today, is a, for the, especially for the new, uh, the young trainees, it's hard to believe that actually the people that started critical care were actually the neurologists. Right? Neurologists and ID physicians were the ones who started doing critical care at the turn of the 20th century uh, when the polio epidemic uh, was, you know, came in at the time. And um, that was the number one reason for institution of mechanical ventilation in early ICUs. And uh, it was neurology and ID uh, were the two main uh, specialties that were caring for these patients. Once the uh, the polio epidemic was, uh, you know, waned and polio was eradicated and other conditions became more prevalent and neurologists and ID physicians sort of disappeared from the ICU. So then we had new specialties taking over, then we had the pulmonary guys and the anesthesiologists coming in and setting up the ICUs, but still, you know, there was a significant number of disorders, uh, especially neuromuscular disorders that required uh, ICU care such as Guillain-Barre and myasthenia gravis crisis, which were the two traditional uh, neuromuscular disorders that were seen in the ICUs. But then, since the 1980s, then new conditions emerged, and those were the critical illness polyneuropathy and critical illness myopathy. However, that's not uh, new. It's like, so it wasn't really in the 1980s. A hundred years prior to that, you had, uh, sorry, you had Dr. Uh, Osler, you know, who already had described this rapid loss of flesh, you know, with prolonged sepsis. So like everything else, it, it takes a really very good observant, a good clinician to figure that out way before everybody else thinks that they are the discoverers of the disorder. So how do we approach these patients? And obviously for us um, in, the, in the ICU, it's quite a big challenge because the differential diagnosis of acute non-traumatic weakness, obviously we're talking about non-traumatic, uh, it ranges from uh, conditions that are life-threatening to things that could be very trivial. You know, they may not be that uh, critical for the ICU care of the patient, but we don't have uh, 
uh, prospective data to try to determine the real frequency of ICU weakness. I think we'll eventually, we will eventually have the data since we're um, collecting of prospective registries in ICUs and neuro ICUs. So I think that perhaps in five more years we will have, and hopefully a worldwide uh, frequency of the uh, number of neuromuscular disorders uh, in the ICU. Well, what we do have are retrospective studies, particularly I think many of you are familiar with uh, Lacomis's studies, you know, retrospective EMG-based series, where uh, he has documented that 28% of the patients that he has studied um, in the ICU uh, by EMG had the so-called so -called traditional neuromuscular disorders, like Guillain-Barre, myasthenia, motor neuron disorders, or myopathies. Right. But most patients, and that's, that's the majority, over 60% over of them, will have acquired disorders. And that's the challenge for, um, for us to uh, diagnose those patients early, trying to prevent that, and then offer uh, post-disorder treatment, as we're going to see that it's very, very difficult. So, and these are sort of the groups, uh, the way we, we group them, you know, the way you, you would do too. I mean, in, in the ICU, we either say, okay, the patient has this uh, muscular weakness, it's either a myopathy, it's a peripheral neuropathy problem, it's a neuromuscular junction disorder or motor neuron disorder. So, so it's very simple if you, if you group them into those, those four major categories, I think it does help trying to come up with uh, the diagnosis and what type of workup uh, you're going to need. I mean, it's key uh, today to uh, remember um, or think about the, in, the neuro, in the motor neuron disorders, uh, the, the poliomyelitis-like syndromes. You know, it's important to think about the new viruses. And I know you, you had Dr. Peter Hotez here yesterday, you know, talking to you about the tropical disorders and the new disorders that have been neglected. And it's amazing to me also that we have a, a huge epidemic on our doorsteps and still we don't have funding to try to protect ourselves from the Zika virus, as you can see there. And I do travel quite a bit, you know, to South America, to different, um, uh, well, all over, but recently South America, and round with physicians there and their ICUs, and believe me, uh, Zika patients are there, and there are quite a few and many of them have Guillain-Barre. And they don't only have Zika virus infection, but they have also chikungunya and uh, dengue fever. So all those disorders are resurgent, they're coming back. So we do have to pay attention to that. So think about Zika, you know, especially in Texas, you know, we have several major international airports here. So we're gonna have people traveling and coming to Texas. Uh, from affected regions. So you may encounter, hopefully not, but it's possible that you may encounter this summer a, a patient with Guillain-Barre associated with one of these viruses, particularly Zika virus. So uh, this slide here is taken from uh, a, a course, a training course that we have created with the Neurocritical Care Society. It's called the ENLS, the Emergency Neurological Support. Uh, course, uh, which is similar to ACLS that the cardiologist, you know, came up with. Um, so this is a course that has been designed to determine uh, what to do during the first hour of neurological emergency. So, and, and in this, we have a module to look at the uh, non-traumatic uh, weakness patients. So what do we do? So what we're telling them, if you look at the column under, um, oh, here's the pointer. I haven't seen, okay. If you look at the column here where it says about emergency etiologists, this is what we're, we're teaching um, uh, all the people that, that take the course is to think about the emergencies. Like what are the things that could potentially kill that patient within the first hour when you come to evaluate them? And then you can think about everything else. So obviously, it's still the other ones that are more common, right? The stroke, you know, CNS infection. In a spinal cord injury, or the patient could have non convulsive status epilepticus, they're also going to present with weakness, electrolyte disorders, toxic mechanisms, and we always tell them do not forget aortic dissections. Okay, aortic dissections can present with spinal cord ischemia. Okay, so you have to think about that. So, in the setting of weakness and chest pain, then aortic dissection it should be on the top of the list. So, these are the the most emergent things that hit that patient could die within an hour from any of those. Um, emergency situations, right? 
And then we tell them that you can move on and try to localize um, the lesion and try to figure out you know, what, uh, what the etiology is. And I think it's important to keep in mind, let's say, if you are the first evaluators, if you're the first responders, for some reason you happen to be in the emergency department and they call you and the patient is weak at that time, so this is what we're telling you, then that first hour, this is the checklist that you should have available, right? So assess the airway, breathing, and circulation, help the ED physician try to figure out, you know, what the best way to care for that patient would be. You are in the best position to characterize the weakness by doing a detailed exam at that, 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 you know, at the, uh, right at that moment if you're able to do it, you know, if there is no uh, emergency to intubate the patient first. And then you can build a differential diagnosis and then consider the emergency causes that we talked about already, make sure that all that is ruled out. And the basic labs, you don't have to bankrupt the hospital, but you just do a basic laboratory testing that will help you determine uh, what else uh, is going on with the patient, including you know, le uh, liver function tests, CK, ESR, and lastly, you think about the relevant imaging. So if you have the checklist with you, then you will know this is what I need to do, this was already done. I don't need to worry about that later. And then this is when the respiratory monitoring begins. It should begin as soon as the patient is assessed uh, in the emergency department. So we always recommend to obtain serial measurements of a pulmonary function every four to six hours. So I think most emergency departments in the U.S. have the support of respiratory therapists. And so it should be fairly easy to ask the respiratory therapist to come by and assess the pulmonary function. What we're asking mostly is the forced vital capacity and the negative inspiratory force, simply because this is available in the majority of the hospitals. So that should be relatively easy to do, and it correlates very well with the ability to fully inflate the lungs and avoid atelectasis. But you have all the tests that could also be done, like the positive expiratory force or the PATH, uh, it correlates with the ability to cough and clear secretions. And one point that it's important to emphasize is the, the issue of the AVG, so the arterial blood gases. Okay, because obviously we love to get arterial blood gases on all these patients, but sometimes we don't know what to do with them. And the main thing about the arterial blood gases is that if they are normal, uh, that gives you a false sense of security, okay? Because the arterial blood gases are not going to help you determine whether the patient is to be intubated or not, unless it's too obvious. Let's say if it's too abnormal, then it's too late, so you miss the boat, right? So you need to intubate that patient right there. Most patients will have a relatively normal-looking blood gas until it's too late, right? So that's important to, uh, to keep in mind. And this will be the normal values that you will be getting from a normal patient. Uh, forced vital capacity, the normal should be 60 mLs per kilo, and this is the threshold for intubation. So if it's 15 mLs per kilo or less, that patient is to be intubated before the patient has a respiratory catastrophe. So you, you talk to the ED physician or whoever is in the hospital, say this is the time to intubate, or tell the intensivist this is the time to intubate. Remember, many of those physicians have never seen these patients, or maybe they have seen very few of these patients so you need to help them also determine when would be a good time to protect that airway. Or with the negative inspiratory force, the normal would be uh, more than uh, minus 70. Uh, if it's less than minus 20, then that patient also needs to be intubated. You can also use the PEF, the value the threshold is 40, okay? So 15, 20, and 40 are the threshold values to determine when it's a good time to intubate the patient. And the reason why we do that, if you say, if we look at the force vital capacity, you can see what's actually happening uh, with the uh, respiratory function of that patient as, this, as that force vital capacity drops. So the normal would be more than 65. Then if you go, if you half that, you go down to 30, then you see the patient will still have an excess secretions. And by 20 mLs per kilo, there is a bunch of atelectasis that, de that develop. And once you get to 15, then when you have the VQ mismatch and hypoxemia, and definitely with below those levels, you have hypoventilation and hypercapnia. Now, it's also important to know that once you get to these levels, you also need to alert uh, whoever is intubating the patient to be uh, careful that the patient may develop hypotension, could be severe, right after intubation. Because if they're retaining CO2, they may be a little bit hypertensive because of the CO2 retention. As soon as you intubate, wash out the CO2, the patients become hypotensive. 
And it could be severe, so you may end up with shock liver and shock kidneys. Uh, it's happening, that's happened. It's actually quite more common than what you think. So we're about intubation, and I know that uh, you may say, well, you know, but I'm the neurologist, I don't intubate, um, why do I care? You know, well, you need to care because you need to instruct the physicians what type of medications to give or not to give. It's important, you'll be surprised as to how many anesthesiologists or the ICU physicians do not know, um, you know, what medications are safe for neuromuscular patients, okay? So what we prefer to do, we prefer to use the rapid sequence intubation. That's what we do. Uh, it shouldn't take more than five minutes to get that tube in. So obviously we always tell them pre-oxygenate the patient to get the SATs above, you know, uh, with 100% FiO2 so that you can maintain normal saturations. Etomidate is always safe. And that's a medication that we always prescribe first. Uh, it's a general anesthetic, but uh, it's very good at maintaining uh, the circulation. It doesn't drop the blood pressure. And still, the patient may be able to have airways. The patient may be able to breathe uh, by him or herself. So uh, that's an advantage. But one thing that you need to know, obviously, as many of you already know, is avoid using succinylcholine if there is evidence of underlying progressive neuromuscular disorder. Many anesthesiologists, many ICU physicians, many ED physicians do not know this, okay? And the problem is, as you know, when you have a, a patient, any patient with prolonged immobility, you have upregulation of nicotinic receptors. So the minute you give succinylcholine, you're gonna have a massive efflux of potassium, and the patient may end up in asystolic cardiac arrest, okay? Especially if they have mildly or moderately impaired uh, kidney function, that could be a big problem. And so then you'll end up dealing with another issue that you didn't have before. So you had the neuromuscular patient was intubated, and now you have a neuromuscular patient in cardiac arrest that you need to resuscitate, okay? So we always tell them, consider using rock coronium. So we always say, use something else, but don't use succinylcholine if the patient has known immo prolonged immobility or some sort of neuromuscular uh, junction uh, uh, disorder or neuromuscular disorders. Now, the other thing, let's say if you already know the patient has myasthenia and the patient is to be intubated, most likely an anesthesiologist may ask you, you know, is it okay if we use succinylcholine? Is it okay if we give the patient rocuronium? And you can say, well, in this case, sure, it's okay, but uh, with succinylcholine, you need to give at least twice as much of the regular dose that you would give a normal patient. And if it's rocuronium, you need to give them about half. Okay, so. It's, uh, so, so, that, so that you know, otherwise the patient is going to have more prolonged neuromuscular junction blockade uh, if you give the regular dose of rocuronium, right? The other thing is, the, you know, we also have available non-invasive ventilation. And probably you may also be asked by the anesthesiologist or by the intensivist, if it's not a neurointensivist, will ask you, is it okay if we put this patient in non-invasive ventilation and then we watch them? I don't want to intubate the patient. Yeah, but it so happens that the patient has Guillain-Barre. So you're gonna say, well, if he has Guillain-Barre, you better intubate the patient because the non-invasive ventilation is not gonna work. The patient's gonna get worse, right? So, um, and then, as I said before, I wanna make sure that, that you also inform them to have a good IV access and have IV fluids running at the time of intubation if the patient has had, have had already uh, CO2 retention because the blood pressure is going to drop and the patient may go into uh, circulatory shock um, very shortly right after intubation. And, and then with regards to the physical exam, again, this is also taken from the ENLS uh, course. Uh, you know, the same thing, we, we uh, walk them through or trying to teach them where to localize the lesion. Of course, you, you are experts. I don't need to, uh, to go over it with you and sorry about this, but we tell them, you know, either it's in the cerebral cortex or the spinal cord, or the anterior horn cell, peripheral nerve, neuromuscular junction, or the muscle, right? So then it's just a matter of knowing the pattern of weakness that the patient has, so sensory loss, and then reflexes, and then you come up with the same list that we talked about before, uh, the same list of acute etiologists. Now there is a, one thing that we do spend a little bit of time uh, with them because these are first responders. You know, we could be giving this course to EMS or could be giving it to ED nurses, so we always uh, stress this group here of the neuromuscular junction simply because that's, if we're gonna have a biological attack, that's where those patients are gonna be in that group, organophosphate, intoxication or botulism, 
And so we tell them also to always to be on the lookout because if they have one of those patients, that needs to be reported, right? Because maybe it's an attack and we need to know um, and act uh, quickly. And then with the saline features, uh, some of the conditions, um, uh, we also stress um, the fact that some findings are gonna be more common with one, or, or one conditions or the others. And these are obviously, these are the most the saline features of the, of the most common conditions that we see in the ICU. For instance, with myasthenia gravis, as you know, you know, the external ophthalmoplegia and ptosis, you know, that would be key, particularly if it's fluctuating. And then if you have the cholinergic crisis, then you have the fasciculations and the autonomic symptoms. Those are gonna be prominent. Guillain-Barre, we always tell them to look at the reflexes. The reflexes are absent, and of course, most likely the patient may have Guillain-Barre, probably. And botulism, of course, will be the look at the pupils and look at the autonomic um, uh, symptoms that the patients are going to have. And if it's modern neuron disorders, then of course, fasciculations again, uh, it's gonna be uh, prominent on that exam. And then if it's spinal cord disease, then of course the sensory level is gonna be the most important part of the examination. All the tips that we, um, uh, it's important to keep in mind is if the patient has a history of animal bite, uh, particularly in the summertime uh, here, or descending paralysis, and the patient on top of that is coagulopathic and has rhabdomyolysis, most likely uh, the patient has been bitten you know, by some sort of a poisonous snake or some other animal, uh, and that's something to keep in mind. If the patient has been exposed to heavy metals, well, let's say you don't have that history, but you do have prominent GI symptoms and evidence of multi-organ failure in the ICU, then you have to suspect that the patient may have heavy metal in, uh, intoxication. Um, and uh, the acute porphyria, you know, it's one thing that we've always been taught, okay? Acute porphyria, always in the differential diagnosis. And uh, there is a problem with the way we were taught, at least in the English language literature. I mean, if you look at the original articles that were published in French, you know, in Press Medical, I think there was a mistranslation. Uh, everything got lost in translation. The French actually reported porphyria uh, in the ICU late in the onset of porphyria, not early. And somehow, when we um, think of porphyria or AIP in, in the English language, uh, we always think that the patient is gonna present like Guillain-Barre, and they don't, okay? They just delay. So the diagnosis is probably already known by the time the patient comes into the ICU. And I don't know if you've followed patients with AIP, you know, obviously it's not as common here in Texas, you know, it's more common in, in people of Mediterranean descent. Um, so there are certain pockets in South America and in Europe where you see quite a bit, or in Sweden, you also see a lot of AIP. But they do not present acutely like Guillain-Barre. So you already know that the patients have AIP. And it's possibly probably after the second or third or fourth attack, that's when you're gonna see them coming into the ICU. Okay. So I think that's important to, to clarify because if you read in all the neurological text, it always says, it's, it's always there. It's always in the differential. And sure, you need to think about it, but most likely the history is already known. Okay. And then the last thing on the list is obviously the tick paralysis. You know, obviously you have tick bite followed by ascending paralysis. You have to look for that, uh, for that uh, female tick is the one that causes the problem. And then let's uh, talk a little bit about GVS. And again, um, you know, I know we had several uh, uh, neuromuscular people here and electrophysiologists that know this probably more than I do about the e EMG characteristics of, of uh, GVS. So obviously you had to consider about the, the typical features, you know, just progressive weakness in both arms and legs, which is the, the features that require diagnosis. I think we still follow the same criteria that were published in this article back in 1992, right, in the New England Journal. And it's important to exclude all the other conditions uh, that we already talked about. You know, and again, you can see there, porphyria is also on the list, okay? But again, by that time, I think the diagnosis will probably be established. And then the most important thing is the, uh, obviously the, also the CSF analysis, you know, the albuminocytological dissociation, and then all the EMG findings that you know better than I do. I, you know, I always rely on the uh, electrophysiologist and our neuromuscular specialist to help me out with this because I, I know very little about EMG these days. 
uh, since I've been in the ICU, but um, these are the variable, uh, the, you know, the findings that you will see depending on the time of exposure, right? So if it's, uh, the early sign will be the F wave in persistence, you know, one to two weeks, the, you know, loss of the F and the H reflexes two to three weeks down the line. And of course, early you may have reduced snap amplitude, and then later on you'll have prolonged CMAP uh, duration and latency on that EMG, uh, nerve conduction velocities. Uh, the one thing that we, that we are interested in, of course, is in treatment, and we want to treat those patients as early as possible. So the earlier you treat, the better. It's been shown that the earlier you institute the treatment, the easier it will be for you to get that patient out of the ICU, and the easier it will be for the patient to recover. Uh, and, and maybe the time that the patient will require mechanical ventilation is also reduced. If you wait too long to institute treatment, then the prognosis is not going to be as good. And we recommend either plasma, plasmapheresis or IVIG. We don't recommend combination therapy. You either pick one or the other. So sometimes what we do, if we have a severe GVS, what we give first is plasmapheresis. Um, just in case if the patient leaves the ICU and for some reason has some recurrence later, may need to be treated again, then we can give them IVIG if they come back. Yeah. But we choose one treatment, one or the other. What about myasthenia? So myasthenia, uh, obviously the, um, uh, the definition of myasthenia crisis, which is important, and now that we have ICD-10, is you have to be specific when you write your diagnosis in the chart, you know, or in, uh, in the EMR, uh, what type of myasthenia gravis admission that is. So in this case, you had to define that it was a crisis, right? So it's any patient who had myasthenia that comes in with worsening that necessitates intubation, right? It necessitates intubation due to respiratory failure or due to airway protection. We say the patient may have prominent bulbar findings, need to be tubed, so that's a myasthenia gravis crisis on top of the patient that comes in with purely respiratory failure. Now, also there is another definition that you have to be aware of, and that's a delayed extubation of more than 24 hours after surgery and the patient that comes in for an elective surgery and they cannot get the patient off the ventilator after 24 hours, then the myasthenia gravis crisis possibility has to jump to the top of your list, okay? Because it means maybe the patient did not know or maybe the patient was having symptoms, ignored them, did not tell anyone. Then the patient underwent uh, surgery, many simple surgery. It doesn't have to be a major, maybe knee replacement or a hip replacement. And then they're calling the intensivist because the patient needs to go to the ICU because they cannot get the patient off the vent. And then 24 hours later, the patient is still intubated. And that's when they start thinking, what are the possibilities here? And you're probably not gonna get called right away, which is, that's a problem. They'll probably call you later uh, unless the patient, unless they involve the neurointensivist. But if they don't, they won't call the neurology consult until days later when they, somebody finally thinks this could be neurological, so call neuro, right? And instead of calling early, they will probably call you later. But that's something to keep in mind. It happens, it happens. I think we, we see probably about one patient per year, you know, that, that comes in for some surgical procedure and then they cannot get the patient off the vent. And these are the precipitants of myasthenia gravis crisis. One thing to remember is that in the, about 40% of the cases, you don't find a reason for the exacerbation. But anything that's gonna stress that patient is going to lead to myasthenia gravis crisis. Of course, infections, respiratory issues are the number one, particularly pneumonia. But it doesn't have to be pneumonia. It could be a viral infection, upper respiratory infection that could lead that patient to um, uh, um, push that patient into crisis. And of course, medications. And you know, the medication list is very long. And for most medications, uh, we don't have you know, a causal relationship, but we have these associations. So uh, medications that we're giving to patients and then the patients develop the crisis. The one thing that, that, that you have to keep in mind, and I think somehow the radiologists now, uh, they know it very well now, is the contrast media. When you're giving patients uh, you know, x-rays or any type of imaging and studies with contrast. So if the patient had myasthenia, then you had to think that the crisis could be precipitated. Okay? Again, this is an association. I think the radiologists already know because of the lawsuits that have happened, so they're very well aware of this, so they'll probably give you a hard time. 
if, the pa if they know that the patient has crisis, except that if the patient has crisis, the patient is intubated anyway, so we don't care anymore. Just go ahead and get the CT with contrast that we need to diagnose whatever we, we need to diagnose. Yeah. And we have the rule of 20s that sort of helped us also when we're talking, especially when we're talking to families because they're, they're interested in knowing you know, what could happen and what's going to happen to them. So we said, well, no, 20, about 20% 20 of the patients with myasthenia will experience a crisis. The number seems to be getting smaller, actually, because I think we're getting better uh, at treating them uh, in the outpatient setting. So it's there, there is fewer and fewer of those patients are coming into the hospital. And we said myasthenia gravis crisis, and about 20% of the cases could be the initial presentation. The hospital stays about 20 days if they come in with the crisis. 20% will require reintubation, and 20% will need to go to rehab. Now, these numbers, the mortality that used to be back in the 70s, used to be 40, 45%. Now it's 5%, and actually, uh, it's probably lower now. And I think we have more recent uh, numbers, but if I had to guess, I'd probably have to put them maybe around 2%. It's, it's so low, it's very low, because most people do very well, and they come in and they get out of the hospital. Uh, after a crisis uh, with very good results. And this is the neuro ICU management uh, for them. Of course, we recommend plasma exchange or IVIG. And for this condition, uh, it's very commonly, we actually do a combination therapy. We don't have you know, clinical trials the way we have them for GVS. So in this case, we have the excuse that we, we can use both. And uh, what we do, we start with plasma exchange, and if that doesn't work, then we give IVIG. Okay. And important to identify the source of deterioration and try to avoid empiric antibiotics as much as you can. You know, C. diff is a common problem now in ICUs, and that will prolong uh, a, a mechanical ventilation duration. Of course, we institute pulmonary toilet very quickly. We replete all the electrolytes, and of course, we do everything else that we do in the ICU, GI prophylaxis and DVT prophylaxis. But again, as I said, those patients actually do very well these days. So the last part of the, 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 you know, the talk is about the, the, this topic, and I know that uh, for the purists here in the room that may be appalled that I'm actually putting everything together here as ICU-acquired weakness, okay? But that's what we like to call this in the ICU these days. So we have lumped everything into one condition, and we said ICU-acquired ICU weakness, and then once we do the rest of the studies, then you can put the uh, name that you like. So, you know, uh, you know, critical illness neuropathy, or critical illness myopathy, or critical illness polyneuropathy. But um, for us, this is a diagnosis that you will see written in the chart is ICU acquired uh, weakness. Right? And as you know, obviously, critically ill patients uh, may suffer from acute myopathy and neuropathy, but it's acquired during the ICU stay. And we always knew that, uh, that this was very important. Okay? The neurological exam is actually the most important thing, I think, in the ICU. I'm going to go back here. Hold on. And it's, it's interesting that it, that was neglected in the general ICU. So the, in the MECUs, in the CQs, they never thought of neurological disorders, but everything is coming full circle now. If you look at the literature, at the medical ICU and the surgical ICU literature, about half of the papers have to do with neurological problems in the ICU. Right. It's the same thing as when the cardiologists were coming up with anesthesiologists with cardiac resuscitation, CPR, CPR, CPR. They were thinking they were helping the heart, but no, they're helping the brain. If we don't have a brain, then you know, we cannot function. So it's really, it's still the neuro issue. We're coming back to the, the same way that we were doing ICU care at the beginning of the 20th century. Neurology, the neuro aspect is the most important thing in the ICU. So now you have all these disorders, you know, that, that you know about, the critical illness myopathy, the polyneuropathy, the combination of myopathy and or neuropathy, critical illness neuromuscular abnormalities, and critical illness neuromyopathy. But then again, this is what we call them now, ICU-acquired uh, paresis or ICU-acquired weakness to encompass everything there up until the workup is done. Okay. So the other thing that has become apparent, as I mentioned to you, you can see most of this literature uh, it was published since 2010. Before this time, there was very little on long-term uh, outcome of patients that go through an ICU. Doesn't matter what type of ICU, after the ICU stay. So we know now that survivors of critical illness have profound residual 
disability. Even a year later, uh, the neurological disability is the number one reason for disability in these patients. It's not the lungs, it's not the kidney, it's not the liver. It's the neurological function of those patients. And many of them will complain of weakness for months or years after discharge. We've already known that. And they have uh, persistent limitations, right? And we think that obviously critical illness, myopathy, or polyneuropathy may have the major role in this disability. So obviously we have a lot, a lot to learn, a lot to, to work on. And these are the criteria that uh, you also know about the critical illness uh, polyneuropathy, right? This was published in Lancet Neurology back in 2011, in which, of course, the number one criteria is that the patient is critically ill. Usually they have multi-organ dysfunction, and they have limb weakness or difficulty weaning the patient from the ventilator that starts later. So the patient comes in, the patient uh, doesn't have respiratory failure upon arrival or may, depending on what the presentation is, gets intubated, is very sick, is on vasopressors, and uh, two weeks later, then they said the patient is still on the ventilator. We cannot get the patient off the, off the, off, off the vent. And then you do the electrophysiological studies and you find axonal motor and sensory polyneuropathy or absence of decremental response and repetitive nerve stimulation to say this is not a neuromuscular problem, uh, this is a, um, a polyneuropathy. And usually those patients will have distal axonal sensory motor uh, polyneuropathy. It's obviously most prominent in the lower limbs. The facial muscles are characteristically not affected, so the patients can still you know, move their face, they can mouth words to you. They have a tracheostomy, of course, by that time, uh, because the respiratory muscles are, are very weak and they cannot uh, um, be weaned off the ventilation. And uh, there are three ways to, uh, to assess this core more objectively, and I think the, these cores are more uh, meant for uh, the non-neurologist, I think, or for the person who let's say in the general ICU or for research. So this is some ways of streamline uh, the diagnosis. So one, of course, is using the MRC scale per se, you know, where you, if you find that the, the score in the MRC scale is less than four in all the muscles that you tested, then you said, okay, this is ICU acquired weakness. That's the easiest way. That's the easiest way for us to do when we come at the bedside. But many of these patients are, uh, have delirium, or they are sedated, so it's very difficult to assess the real strength. Or um, they also come up with the MRC sum score, you know, they give a value from zero to 60, depending on uh, 12 muscles that are assessed, and if it's less than 48 in two sessions, 24 hours apart, then you say, yes, the patient has ICU acquired weakness. So if you wanna be more uh, specific and more objective and teach the ICU physicians how to do it, or if the patient can uh, cooperate, then you can do the dominant hand dynamometry. I have never used it, uh, you know, but it's reported in the literature. I find it very difficult to use in the ICU. Patients are not cooperative. Uh, you know, again, as I said, they're confused or they're sedated. This might work better, let's say, once the patient is gone to an LTAC or, or to a rehab facility where you could perhaps get more cooperation, but in the ICU, I haven't found this very useful. And, but these are the criteria that have been um, um, described. You know, they have to specific, the patient has to be sitting upright, the elbows have to be flexed at 90 degrees, and then you do three evaluations and then repeat at 24 hours, and then you obtain the force value. If it's less than, a, a, you know, 11 kilograms force in, in, in men and seven kilograms force uh, for women, then the diagnosis is, is there. So you say, I see you acquire weakness. Again, this is what we normally use, you know, MRC scale typical, which is common and said, yeah, all the limb, all the muscles are weak. This patient has ICU acquired weakness. It's time to do the workup. Unless, of course, we're participating in a research study, then we do have to comply with something more objective and uh, so that it can be followed uh, down the line. That's the beauty of doing, I guess, doing this sum score, for instance, is that you can actually recalculate later and then say, okay, the patient has improved. Right? That's the only way, uh, the advantage that I see. And again, you know, you, so you're familiar with the electrophysiology and the histology of the patient with critical illness um, um, polyneuropathy. Now for critical illness myopathy, again, it's the same, the criteria is the same, would be the patient is critically ill, right, similar. The patient also has limb weakness and difficulty winning, but the difference is gonna come uh, when you do the electrophysiological studies, right? 
In this case, of course, we have the CMAP amplitude, so it's going to be less than 80% of the lower limit of normal. And then you have the sensory nerve action potential amplitudes that are more than 80% of the lower limit of normal, right? And if you're able to, or if you want to do a muscle biopsy, then you'll find uh, the findings of primary myopathy, for instance, uh, in that, that case in the slide, will be the myosin loss or muscle necrosis. And again, this will be the, the histological features and then the electrophysiological pattern or myopathic pattern on the EMG. You can just kind of go through this. And this is the pathophysiology. This is, even though we don't know uh, for sure, you know, how this works. I mean, we, uh, we have now some animal models, so there is some studies now in animals trying to determine how this might work. I think most people agree that what happens first, once you have the sepsis or the trauma or the stress, then you develop systemic inflammatory uh, syndrome, which will eventually lead to one of those uh, conditions. Obviously, as I said, the neurological complications are the number one complication in the ICU these days. So septic encephalopathy or critical illness polyneuropathy or myopathy. And as you can see here from this picture, I think is beautifully presented from this article from two years ago in the New England. Um, this is what we have. What we have is essentially, um, you know, nerve ischemia. That's exactly what happens. And neurovascular injury. And this is what's coming up now also in animal models. This is what they've been finding. So that that's how you end up with uh, muscle necrosis or loss of muscle cells or nerve cells that end up with uh, the condition. So. Obviously, what we have to do is try to avoid or to prevent the nerve ischemia, but that's the million-dollar question right now. And again, this will be to summarize what I just said, you know, with electrophysiological features of ICU acquired weakness. If you have a polyneuropathy up here from the tops and you have normal to minimally reduced nerve conduction velocities, and what you have is reduced CMAP and reduced compound SNAPs, and if it's critical illness, myopathy, then you will have reduced CMAP amplitude and reduced muscle excitability uh, on direct stimulation and then normal snaps. And again, this is just to emphasize the same thing, that the, the differential is still the same, does not change. If the patient stays there uh, for two weeks or three weeks in the ICU, you still have to do your exercise and go over it and try to determine whether something else may be the issue. Is it Guillain-Barre? Maybe people missed it. Is it myasthenia crisis that we've missed? Is it porphyria that people, maybe the patient had a diagnosis, but nobody thought about it? Ethan Lambert, you know, ALS, vasculitic neuropathy, cervical myelopathy, or botulism. All those things you have to, again, come up with the same. It has to go through your brain so that you can say, okay, this is all being ruled out at this point. And again, these are the main risk factors that have been found in all epidemiological studies in the ICU, bearing in mind that all these studies have a lot of limitations. Many of them are retrospective, and many of them are based on single ICUs. So again, we don't have a worldwide uh, study that uh, should help us determine the true incident frequency of the condition and the true risk factors. But as you can see, these are the ones that come up for most studies, you know, women for some reason are more likely to develop um, this condition. Patients with sepsis, patients with any catabolic state or multi-organ failure, or patients that have immobility. So immobility in the ICU is not a good thing. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that in another slide. And then you have hyperglycemia. It's another problem. Hyperglycemia is also being associated with uh, this condition, and there is some evidence that correcting the blood glucose might help. So what about the outcome? The outcome of these patients, and I think we already talked about these patients with these conditions have a very high mortality, much higher mortality than patients who do not develop it. And uh, if the patients have uh, critical illness polyneuropathy, they have slower recovery, or they may not recover at all. Whereas the patients with critical illness myopathy, they may recover within six months, so they have a better prognosis. Unless you have the severe myonecrosis that we see sometimes in the ICU, those patients do, don't do that well. And so about a third of those patients do not recover independent walking or spontaneous ventilation. So what that means is that you come back to see them a year later, they're still in the LTAC, they're still requiring mechanical ventilation, and nothing has changed. And again, with regards to the incidence, I already uh, told you that uh, 
we don't know what the true incidence is, so we have to go with limited studies that we have, usually from single ICUs. But as you can see, the incidence will change depending on how severe the underlying condition is. For instance, if the patient is just simply has mechanical ventilation but nothing else, the incidence could be, the frequency could go as high as 33%. Now, one thing that we've learned now with mechanical ventilation is that yes, mechanical ventilation is helpful. Well, we're trying to make the patients breathe better, oxygenate better, but if you don't use it appropriately, then you create a systemic inflammatory condition that could lead to critical illness polyneuropathy. And this is something that we're also teaching intensivists these days to use what we call lung protective ventilation. This here, in the past, you know, we used to use a lot of large volume ventilation, and that was probably driving a lot of these systemic problems or neurological problems. Today, we do lung protective ventilation, so the, I'm assuming the frequency will probably drop now that we're using better modes of ventilation and we're doing it differently. If the patient has ARDS, the frequency could go as high as 77%, but if you could see all patients with septic shock will have uh, ICU-acquired weakness, all of them, 100%, that's a given. And that's something that is not discussed with families, or many people do not discuss with the families, and that needs to, that needs to go into the equation, because they need to know this. Yes, they have septic shock. Yes, we're going to give them antibiotics. Yes, we're going to give them uh, vasopressors. That's all going to resolve, hopefully. But if it does resolve, then he's going to be left or she's going to be left with ICU-acquired weakness. It's going to require mechanical ventilation. It's going to require tracheostomy and possibly go to an LTAC uh, for a prolonged period of time. So all this needs to be discussed. Or uh, Also with encephalopathy, right? Many patients will never recover. Well, they'll be left with... Uh, severe neurological changes after the sepsis. Okay. With regards to the management, of course, there is no specific treatment. We don't have specific treatment uh, right now to prevent um, uh, uh, this condition, but we know that we have some evidence that aggressive insulin therapy may decrease the frequency of critical illness myopathy or polyneuropathy. One caveat is that we know that if we're too aggressive, mortality goes up on those patients because they develop hypoglycemia. So on one, the one end, yes, it's good. You may prevent uh, the critical illness polyneuropathy. At the other end, then you may increase mortality because they may develop hypoglycemia. So that's a problem. So I think we need more studies to, uh, to address it. One thing that we're doing in all ICUs now is we're using these bundled ICU measures, the so-called ABCDE, and you need to be aware of this because we're, we're awake, those patients are being awakened more frequently than before. We don't keep them sedated forever the way we used to. Um, we try to do some coordination of awakening and breathing, and of course, delirium assessment. As I told you before, now finally, they got the message. The neuro, the brain, and the nerves are the most important organs that need to be protected in the ICU. They finally got it. Okay, now it's in all ICUs. They're all doing this now. Delirium assessment, early exercise, so what they're really doing is helping the brain and the nerves recover and recover uh, much earlier than what we used to do. There is one condition now that, that, we, that is very well recognized, and this is going to uh, be an issue for all of us because we're, we're paying for all these patients, so it's going to drain a big chunk of our economy too, is a chronic critical illness. Okay? So obviously we're getting better now at getting these patients through the ICU but then they're left with mechanical ventilation, they need to go somewhere, right? So they go to uh, acute care hospitals, right, or the LTACs. And I know uh, several of you go and see those patients at the LTACs, and you see them there, and they stay there for weeks or months, sometimes years, in the LTACs. And these are patients that went through episodes of acute critical illness that led them to the LTAC, but they keep on coming back. They keep on returning to the hospitals and then back to the LTAC, back to the hospital, back to the LTAC, right? So obviously they require intensive care and rehabilitative skills, but uh, one thing that is coming up uh, more and more often in the literature is the discussions of palliative care with these patients, because many of them will have the chronic, uh, you know, chronic uh, critical illness polyneuropathy uh, from which they will never recover. So that's, that's a, an issue that needs to be addressed uh, with the families as well. And in conclusion, um, obviously the neuromuscular disorders in the ICU are common, very common. Uh, the weakness can be the reason for the ICU admission or the weakness can develop during the ICU stay. So it's important to keep in mind that we have this checklist, it's important to keep the checklist somewhere 
for the acute weakness. That's important. You know, you can do the evaluation acutely when the patient comes in. You are there to help the ICU physicians, if it's not a neuro ICU physician, to help them care for these patients. You have an important role, and you have to tell them also what type of medications they, they could use for intubation. That's key. Uh, because you know, you know the condition better than they do. Um, so critical illness, myopathy, and polyneuropathy are probably the most common causes of uh, ICU acquired weakness. And most of the time, what we do is just supportive care, you know, with aggressive early rehabilitation, and that cannot be stated enough. So early rehabilitation uh, is what we're doing now in our ICUs. Early, we mean as soon as the patient can follow commands and be awake, the patient is ready for rehabilitation. Before that, is passive range of motions. That's what we do until they're awake. Uh, with that, I'll stop, and I think we have 10 minutes for, uh, for questions. Thank you. No questions. Was it very clear, or they didn't understand? <laughs> Thank you very much.